Okay, we are live. Good afternoon. Welcome to Down by the River, a redevelopment expert exchange webinar. I'm Anna Withrow. I'm a redevelopment specialist here at the Northern West Virginia Brownfields Assistance Center. I'm filling in for Carrie Staten today, who is, she's out on an extended leave at this, this time. I'm going to be giving a quick background on the programming that made this webinar possible, and then just a few housekeeping items, and then I'll introduce our speaker, Nina Chase. This webinar is part of the Northern West Virginia Brownfields Assistance Center's program, the Redevelopment Expert Exchange. The purpose of the program is to provide a platform for project experts throughout the region to share success stories, tips, and advice that can be used for managing similar projects. The exchanges that uh, are, are and have been part of a peer-to-peer -peer format where folks interested in learning about a particular topic will visit a site, they'll attend a custom wor workshop of sorts, and they'll consult with project experts. Also part of the program is this monthly webinar series where experts like Nina will present project best practices related to their topics. If you have ideas or if you'd like to request a face-to-face -face expert exchange uh, or to suggest a topic for one of these webinars, visit the West Virginia Redevelopment Collaborative website to do so. For upcoming webinars, um, it looks like we have on December 8th at 3 p.m., uh, Pat Ford with the Business Development Corporation of the Northern Panhandle will be presenting Deal Making for Deal Junkies. So stay tuned for more details about that. And just a couple more items to help you navigate the webinar today. Everyone except for myself and Nina is in mute mode to limit any sort of interference. So if you have questions, you'll see in the webinar control panel that there's a drop-down menu where you can enter questions at any time. Um, this webinar, like the others in the series, is also being recorded. So if you miss something or if you'd like to share the content with a colleague, you may access the recording on the WVRC website at a later time. So finally, let me introduce to you Nina Chase, who will be presenting Down by the River. Nina is the Senior Project Manager at River Life in Pittsburgh. As a nonprofit advocacy organization, River Life has worked over the past two decades to transform Pittsburgh's riverfronts from industrial working waterfronts to thriving mixed-use communities. Nina is a recent addition to the River Life team. Formerly trained as a landscape architect, Nina previously worked as a landscape architect and urban designer at Sasaki & Associates in Boston. Nina's experience includes planning and building in public spaces and cities. Nina is a native of Morgantown and graduated with degrees in landscape architecture from both Harvard's Graduate School of Design and West Virginia University. And I had the pleasure of working with Nina this fall as she and uh, her colleague, Jason Kernick, did four workshops throughout West Virginia where they shared their model for riverfront development in uh, various cities, and I, th I think we'll hear more about that today. So let me switch the screen, bear with me here. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Anna, can you see my screen? I can, get, I can see your screen. Okay, perfect. perfect. All right, let me just rearrange this real quick. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks, Anna, for the introduction. I'm glad you could all join us for the webinar today. Um, thanks for taking the time. Um, my name is Nina Chase, and as Anna mentioned, I'm the Senior Project Manager at River Life in Pittsburgh. Um, and today, what I'll be talking to you about are River Life best practices and how you can use um, some of the tools that we've created and the best practices we put together so you can engage your own community um, in riverfront redevelopment. Um, and as Anna briefly touched on, uh, this year River Life, we've received a grant from the Benedum Foundation to distribute River Life's best practices and resources to um, other communities outside of Pittsburgh in the Ohio and Mon River Valley. So my colleagues and I have been working with the Northern West Virginia Brownfield Assistance Center um, and the Mon Valley Rivertown program here in Pennsylvania. Um, to distribute these resources, and today Anna had invited me to present this work to you all. So thanks to Anna um, for making this making this happen. 
Um, I'm also, it's been exciting working with Anna and her team, because uh, on a personal note, I'm, I'm from Morgantown, as Anna mentioned, uh, grew up, went to Morgantown High School in WVU, so I'm excited to be working on opportunities in West Virginia on riverfronts uh, and expanding beyond just the, the city of Pittsburgh boundaries. Um, so to get us started, next, let's see, get us started. Uh, what I wanted to cover today, um, what we'll be doing is introducing, I'm going to introduce River Life, who we are, um, what we've been doing over the past 17 years. I'll be presenting some of the resources that we've put together and um, resources that we've been presenting to other communities in West Virginia and Pennsylvania over the past year. Um, and this includes some of our best practices. And then I wanted to give a brief overview of those workshops that Anna had mentioned um, that we've been putting on uh, in West Virginia and Pennsylvania through support from the Benedict Foundation. So you'll get a flavor of what we've been up to over the past uh, few months. So a little bit of background to kick us off. Uh, River Life, if you're not familiar with our work, um, we were established in 1999, and our mission is to reclaim, restore, and promote Pittsburgh's riverfronts. Um, and Anna also mentioned that you know for the past almost two decades, 17 years, we've worked um, really to take what were industrial working riverfronts, as you can see in this picture with all the boats and the, the rail lines and the active uh, commerce right on the edges, um, you know, transforming these active working waterfronts into thriving mixed-use communities that have trails and riverfront parks. And if you've been to Pittsburgh and you visited maybe the stadiums or Point State Park or downtown Pittsburgh, you'll know um, the transformation that's happened and it's pretty, pretty outstanding. Um, so the, the transformation process really started in 1999. Um, when River Life was formed, we were originally called River Life Task Force, and we were a task force out of the mayor's office. Um, and we were tasked with uh, putting together the vision plan, the master plan for Pittsburgh's riverfronts. And it started with a, over, I think, it was like over 100 and maybe 200 meetings, public meetings. You can see a couple of meetings here: um, community activation and engagement, site visits, tours, riverboat tours. Um, understanding what the riverfronts were and, and really what they could be in the future. And River Life was working with the city and a number of other organizations in the city um, to put this riverfront master plan together and, and River Life spearheaded that as River Life Task Force. Um, and what came out of this, sorry, it's taking a second to transition slides. So what came out of this exercise was the vision plan for Pittsburgh's riverfronts. And you can see this image here looking towards the point of Pittsburgh down the Ohio River and then splitting to the Mon and the Allegheny. Um, this was a vision for a 13-mile loop uh, that included most of downtown Pittsburgh. And the next slide here you'll see that 13-mile loop, which really um, we use a couple bridges as our endpoints to the West End Bridge over on the left-hand side of the slide, the 31st Street Bridge on the top of the slide along the Allegheny River and then the hot metal bridge down on the Mon River, down by the south side. And um, Three Rivers Park, this was the 13-mile loop became known as Three Rivers Park, and this was what the vision plan encompassed. And so since then, since the vision plan was released in 2001, um, we have been building out the different projects that make up that vision plan over the years. So you can see in the different green colors completed projects versus projects underway and future projects that we're working on today. And so I'll go through a couple of the projects that have, that have happened since then. Um, and in addition to the vision plan, you know, uh, not only was it just about uh, visioning for what the future parks could be, but really understanding what the um, investment, return on investment could be, and what, what now we have as kind of the after um, numbers for the economic investment in the riverfront. So we've invested um, almost $130 million in Three Rivers Park since 1999, and that has catalyzed $2.6 billion in riverfront development. Um, and that's also led to $4.1 billion in total riverfront and adjacent development. So that's development that happens outside right along the riverfront, but also in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, and so it's an incredible story when you look at it, and, and you can say that there's been a 20 to 1 return on investment. Um, as my colleague Jay always says, even if that was a quarter of that, um, we would be excited about it because that's a you know, 5 to 1 return on investment. Um, so a couple of the projects that have been pivotal in making this happen include the North Shore Riverfront Park, which happened along with the construction of Heinz Field and PNC Park. So if you've ever been to a Steelers game or a Pirates game, you've experienced the Riverfront Park here. This is a before image um, showing Heinz Field under construction. And then an after image showing Riverfront Park along the front edge of that riverfront. And what was exciting was River Life was part of the, the team that helped um, 
you know, work with the developers and the stadium builders to push the stadiums back further, a little bit away from the riverfront, and give space for the riverfront and for that park to be constructed so that you can have that nice lawn and the, the plantings and the wide promenade along the edge where you could dock boats. Um, the North Shore Riverfront Park is also really um, amazingly successful because it's free. Um, this image is showing a couple kids who are playing in the, um, the uh, water steps, which is an incredible project uh, and, and place to sit in the summer months. Um, it's a free water feature where kids can splash and play in the water. Um, and, you know, it's been exciting to watch these projects unfold and be successful because they're available to everyone. It doesn't matter what your, what your background is, how much money you make, you know, what your race or uh, education level is, um, you can come and enjoy these parks and they're for everyone, they're for all of Pittsburgh and it's, it's a very democratic space. Um, here's an image of the convention center. So if you've been to a convention in Pittsburgh, this is the convention center under construction to the right. You can see kind of the strip district in the back, in the background. Um, the riverfront was totally unaccessible before um, and the uh, convention center was being built and it is um, one of the greenest buildings in the country. And so the idea of connecting to the riverfront was something that everybody wanted to have happen. Um, but, you know, it was, it was hard because there wasn't any actual riverfront connection to begin with. But today we have this incredible riverfront uh, trail that connects up into the Strip District and down to the point. If you kept going to the right, you'd go down to Point State Park. Um, and there's this under uh, connection underneath the convention center that brings you out right onto the waterfront. You have planting and benches and seating and areas for people to congregate right on the water's edge. Um, Point State Park, so if anyone's been to Point State Park where the fountain is, right at the convergence of the Allegheny and the Mon Monongahela River, um, Point State Park came uh, with a park that was built um, but fell into disrepair and so Riverless was part of the master planning team to put together a master plan to um, revitalize Point State Park and bring back to life the park that had been there, um, complete with festival grounds and then the fountain as well. Um, the fountain looked like this for many years, it fell into a state of disrepair and was not being used. Um, and then through a hefty um, fundraising campaign, River Life and, and the, the partner organizations, the City and the Allegheny Conference, um, we were able to re, re, uh, reopen the fountain and reopen Point State Park. Here you can see it on opening night. You can see the fountain um, there and everybody who's gathered to see it turned on for the first time. Um, South Shore Riverfront Park, so if you've been to uh, Southside Works, which is down on the south side of Pittsburgh, um, you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see, oh yeah, it's, you can see the Cheesecake Factory off on the distance. Um, this is what it looked like before. And then today we have a Riverfront Park that actually um, mediates the grade change, um, and we have an amphitheater and trail system that links up to some new public marinas. You also notice in all of our, in all of our before and after shots, uh, the before shot is a nice gray, day in the middle of winter with no people, and then our aftershots are a beautiful sunny days with lots of people on the riverfront. <laughs> um, so those are just a couple of examples of the projects that we've worked on a little bit before and after. Um, but really the, the work that we wanted to show you today was more about the resources that we've put together. Um, so over the years, you know, in the past 17 years, we've learned a lot through the projects that we've worked on, um, what to do, what not to do, partners that we've, that we've um, engaged in projects. Um, and we put together a series, of, um, a series of resources that we have on our website. So if anyone's interested after this webinar, you're, you're more than welcome to go to our website riverlifepgh.org forward slash resources, and you can find all the resources that I'll be discussing today. Um, but, you know, as, ri as riverfront development has increased in Pittsburgh and then also in the region, which we've seen, we've been committed to really sharing our resources and best practices. And um, so with the support of the Benenden Foundation, we have developed resources, um, including we have a guide to riverfront development and our Three Rivers Park Economic Impact Analysis. And so I'll go through a couple of these things um, today to just give you an idea of the resources we have available so that you too can um, engage your own community in riverfront redevelopment and kind of take some of the lessons we've learned and apply them to your own community at home. So we, we put together this presentation and we've organized it by um, uh, what we've learned. So we have three principles and, and lessons learned. Um, the first building being building partnerships, being the first and, and probably most important uh, lesson that we've learned over the years. The second, designing beautiful and functional riverfronts, and I'll talk a little bit more about each of these. And then also this idea of documenting the value that you've created um, with the project that you've been working on. 
So I'll start off with uh, the first lesson learned, build partnerships. And this is absolutely key. You know, we, we work with a number of, we have been working with a number of um, projects here in Pittsburgh, but that now reaching out beyond the city limits of Pittsburgh um, and talking to communities about how to just get a project started. And really it has to do with new partnerships. You have to have the landowners at the table, the city, the county, maybe even the state at the table, um, not only for buy-in for project support, but also for funding. Um, so all of these entities, you know, you might want to have a riverfront project in your community, but if you don't own the land or if the city owns the land and they don't know that you're interested in it, if you don't have them at the table, it's kind of a moot point. So ensuring that you're building partnerships from the ground up, making sure you have your landowners at the table, your city or county or state, your foundations, your grantors, people who can provide money for projects like this, um, community members, this is where it all begins almost often, almost always, um, bringing together other other community groups that might be working on similar projects or similar issues, bringing them all to the table along with the nonprofits in the area. Um, this is where River Life acts as a, as a facilitator. You know, we're a nonprofit um, that brings together all of the different organizations to the table to have conversations to get everybody on the same page with a vision for a project. Um, and then we're often the ones who are working with the foundations and the grant givers um, and the community members to make sure that the financing and the money is in line, not only the vision, but the money and the, the tools that you need to actually implement a project. Um, we also like to work with universities and high schools. You know, you can get a lot of volunteer um, effort through high schools and universities, and also it's an incredible way to reach back into the community and build stewardship of projects early on um, in people's lives and be able to give people a reason to come to Earthfront from a very early age. Um, so a couple projects that were really um, uh, only possible because partnerships include Point State Park. Like I mentioned, this was um, done between River Life, the City of Pittsburgh, and the Allegheny Conference. Um, this project was an enormous fundraising um, effort, but also an implementation effort. And without the support of all the groups coming together, this would not have happened. We're currently working on a project, the North Shore Environmental Restoration Project. We're partnered with the Army Corps of Engineers um, since they control all of our navigable waterways, which includes the Monongahela River and the Ohio River and the Allegheny River in Pittsburgh. We are often working with them on projects to make sure that we are uh, meeting all the right uh, criteria for projects. But this project in particular, um, they are leading and we're bringing um, we're bringing to the table all of the city landowners and the landowners who are private landowners and developers um, to do a really beautiful habitat restoration and environmental restoration along the Ohio River. Um, the Strip District Riverfront Park Vision Plan, um, this is a great example of uh, River Life's role in building partnerships um, to make a project happen. So if you've been to the Strip District in Pittsburgh, um, it's not immediately obvious that the riverfront is only a few blocks um, to your left, but um, uh, River Life spearheaded the Riverfront Park Vision Plan for the Strip District as a way to get all of the landowners, um, the city, the developers, all to the same table to create a vision for the Riverfront so as new development happens over the years, there's a cohesive idea for where it's going to head in the future. Um, and so this Riverfront Park Vision Plan, this is also on our website, but it's a big document um, and it has uh, great examples of, of park ideas um, and ways to engage people right along the edge of the Riverfront complete with a Riverfront Trail as well. Um, this project is a really fun, kind of more grassroots project. Um, this is our To Be Determined TDD mural. This is under the Fort Duquesne Bridge in Pittsburgh on the Allegheny River. Um, and this was an, a really fun project uh, where River Life put out an RFP for an artist to do a piece of art underneath the Fort Duquesne Bridge. Um, and the artist came back with this uh, great idea to do a paint by number mural underneath the bridge during the Three Rivers Arts Festival. And so the artist actually on the left, you can see the outlines of the mural painted in black with the little numbers or letters indicating what paint color to use. And then individual community members came out during the Three Rivers Arts Festival and painted each of the individual areas with a, with a color that they were given. Um, but this was a great example of partnerships at a very um, at a very simple level, um, just getting you know community members together to paint a mural. Um, and it, this has been a great project, one as an example um, of partnership, but also of a, a mural that helped really revitalize a section of the riverfront that had been had gone into disrepair. There was graffiti. There were uh, people you know, like inhabiting and living underneath the bridge. But now since the mural's been up, there's been no graffiti whatsoever. It's been up for almost two years. Um, so it's a really nice example for us to point to to say, hey, you know, when you get people to commit to something and and um, and and give them a reason to come down and and build stewardship around an art piece, it'll actually last and 
and stand the test of time. Um, so the second lesson that we've learned is, uh, and we want to uh, report back to everyone, is this idea of designing beautiful and functional riverfronts. So not only do we want to have spaces that are, are gorgeous, you know, they're clean, they're well maintained, they're full of lively plants and people and activities, um, but we also want them to function uh, for multiple multiple uses and multiple reasons. So this idea of, of designing multifunctional riverfronts. We want to use high quality materials and we also want to integrate habitat. We also want to think about stormwater, how you can weave in green infrastructure as a way to help reduce stormwater runoff into riverfronts. Um, we also often talk about the idea that the riverfronts are the front door of a project instead of just the, the back side of a project. We're often working with developers and landowners to kind of reframe their thinking around what the riverfront edge of their building can be. Um, and this idea of connecting riverfronts back to the neighborhood. So not only is it about the parallel connections with trails along the riverfront, but also the perpendicular connections from the neighborhoods themselves back into the neighborhood or back to the riverfront. So thinking of uh, limiting obstacles to the riverfront and making sure that one, it's beautiful, but it's also functioning so that people can get to the riverfront. You can use the trails that are wide enough for you know not only pedestrians, but bicyclists, cyclists, um, you know, people with strollers, ADA accessibility, all of the elements of a, of a riverfront that make it functional for, for everybody. Um, and so a lot of this thinking is in our Guide to Riverfront Development book. So this is online. Um, it's an incredible resource. It's uh, dense and it's a great um, read if you are uh, starting a riverfront project and you're talking to a developer or a landowner and you want to have language uh, to use about, you know, trail width or design standards for lighting and benches and stormwater, um, all of these ideas about perpendicular connections and parallel connections, um, this guide can help steer that conversation and give you some really good precedents to use for, for your own community. Um, so a couple of pages from that, you can see on the left, there are uh, the principles for riverfront development. Um, these can help steer the conversation or the direction for a riverfront project of your own. Then on the right, you can see a couple of the graphics that are showing, um, you know, uh, examples of typical sections of riverfronts when you're wanting to create more habitat and create a more ecologically healthy riverfront edge. So the third lesson we've learned is this idea of documenting the value that you have created. Um, you know, throughout this presentation, I've shown you a couple of before and after images. This type of um, storytelling and narrative is very powerful. So as you're developing your own projects. If you're in a before stage right now, make sure you're taking pictures. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we take all of our pictures, little before pictures during the darkest, gloomiest days <laughs> in the middle of winter. And then our after images are, you know, they're going to be filled with people and it's going to be a lovely, sunny day. But um, using, using these tools, before and after imagery, and being able to have data to tell the economic story, which I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, all of this is very powerful and it can be used as to continue to attract investment in a riverfront project. So you can actually leverage the value that you've created towards increased dollars uh, for more redevelopment um, in the future. And so our economic story, all of the data that we collected um, for us to be able to say that we, uh, that the city and landowners have invested $130 million in riverfronts and that we've seen the 20 to 1 return on investment. This comes from our Three Rivers Park Economic Impact Analysis. This was done in 2015. Um, and what this document, which is also on our website, um, this document uh, was uh, pulled together all the information about property value increase and um, and investment along riverfronts and how that's transformed the riverfronts in Pittsburgh. And what what you can do with public space and how that public space can uh, can see a return on investment. Um, so the document starts with um, a series of precedents across the country of public spaces, how much they cost, and then the um, amount of development that those public spaces actually catalyze. And, and again, seeing that return on investment ratio and the property value increase so that you can have a strong argument when you're saying, yes, we invested you invested X number of dollars here, we've actually seen X number of dollars um, returned, create the provocative argument for investment in public space. Um, so not only do we look at precedents across the country, but then we zoomed in on Pittsburgh specifically and looked at property value change um, over a 10 year span of time and saw that actually in the riverfront zone of influence, which is the area in white on this slide, there was a 60% increase in property value. And in the outside the riverfront zone of influence area in gray, there was a 32% increase, which is still great, but um, we were able to say that there was a 
twice as much property value increase in the riverfront zone. Um, so those are the lessons that we've been um, presenting at our at our Riverfront Rivertown workshop over the past few months. As, as Anna mentioned, um, in the spring of 2016, we uh, received additional support from the Benedum Foundation to kind of showcase the waterfront planning and development models that could be replicated in communities outside of Pittsburgh. And, and since June, our team, which included my, myself and my colleague Jay Sikernick, we've worked with Anna and the, and the Northern West Virginia Brownfield Assistance Center and the Rivertown Program um, to identify different stakeholder groups in both Vermont and Ohio River Valleys um, that could benefit from river life resources. So throughout this past fall, we actually um, hosted seven workshops in Pennsylvania and West Virginia where we presented our best practices and um, successful funding strategies based on these kind of riverfront-focused redevelopment projects in Pittsburgh. And we um, hosted this series of workshops uh, to, one, introduce everybody to river life, but then also to develop next steps for riverfront projects um, in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. So we um, had the workshops. So here you can see a map. Um, Pittsburgh is up at the top. You can see we, um, we were in Chester and we were in West Virginia, Monongahela, California, Fredericktown, Brownsville, and West Brownsville, Pennsylvania and then back in Morgantown and Fairmont down below. And what we did was this summer, as I mentioned, we had site visits. So we went and visited each of the communities and took a peek at what was going on, um, what the riverfronts looked like today. And then we hosted this series of workshops and we gathered um, anywhere between. We had, some workshops had four people in them. Others had about 20 to 25. Um, but it was successful varying on, uh, depending on the different capacity of each, each town and what they wanted to get out of the workshops. Um, and so what we did, we had the workshops and we familiarized all the stakeholders with River Life's resources just like I did today. Um, and we also went through an exercise where I, we identified roadblocks. So each community, we asked everybody to answer a series of questions um, and identify roadblocks. Um, and figure out how River Life and our experience in Pittsburgh, how we could apply some of the lessons, the lessons learned and, and apply our expertise to projects and roadblocks in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. And then in Pennsylvania, we also gave updates on the new Pennsylvania Riverfront Tax Credit, um, which had been spearheaded by my colleague Jay um, and has, has now been written into law. So there will be a tax credit um, that will help provide funding for waterfront projects across the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and that uh, will be able to help for smaller projects outside the city of Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia um, and provide developers an incentive to um, create riverfront projects. Um, so as part of the workshops, what we did, uh, and as I mentioned, with the, we were identifying roadblocks um, that were impeding riverfront development projects. Um, we asked everybody to use sticky notes, and we asked a series of questions and kind of did a word brainstorm um, where everybody had to write down one or two words and answer answer three questions. So we had three questions, um, the first being, how would you describe your riverfront today? So, you know, what, what does your riverfront look like today? Is it accessible? Is it, um, is it green? Is it, you know, healthy? Is it active? Um, we asked everybody just to describe the riverfront today. Then after that, we asked everyone to describe their ideal riverfront, what they would like to see in the future. And then we asked um, the group what were their experiences or perceived roadblocks to implementation, what was keeping them from going from what they had today towards their ideal um, riverfront. And what was really um, illuminating, it was, it was uh, you know, in the end it was kind of obvious, but it was also illuminating over the course of the workshops, we actually found similarities across the board. Um, so when we asked everyone these uh, about their riverfront today, um, all of these words that you see on the screen, these are the words that were uh, most frequently written down. The bigger words were more frequently written down and the smaller words were less frequently written down. And there was a, a what was exciting is that um, there was a, there were a lot of words about the potential. The fact that the riverfronts were undeveloped but yet they were beautiful and but they were inaccessible and there wasn't a way to get to them and they were disconnected from the communities in which they could serve. And then everyone, these are all the words that everybody wrote down about I, their ideal riverfront. And you can see the word access really pops out. Um, the idea that ideally a riverfront would be accessible, that it would be connected to a community, that it would be friendly, that it would be a destination where people would go and there would be recreation or entertainment and trails and restaurants and docks. So these are all the things that everybody wanted to see in it. And it was pretty consistent in, in all of the communities that we were working in. 
And then the roadblocks that, that were, um, again, even more consistent, you can see these words are even bigger. That meant that more and more people actually uh, more frequently wrote down funding and money as the reasons that the roadblocks, uh, these were the roadblocks to impeding um, riverfront development. But you can see funding, money, um, buy-in, development, property, ownership, um, these all illuminated the fact that, you know, as we were saying in our in our lessons learned, the first lesson we learned was this idea of partnerships and getting everyone to the table, including the people who can give money, but also the landowners and people who can provide the access to the riverfront trail. Um, so what we've been doing, um, we've actually taken all this information and we've summarized it into a series of, of documents and we're working with, with Anna and her team and the team at the Mon River, um, Mon Valley River Towns program and we're working on seeking additional funding to continue working with these communities to um, either implement projects or plan for projects um, in the future. So that's where, we're, that's where we are right now, which is exciting. Um, so with that, uh, that's everything I had today and I'm happy to answer any questions via the chat box. Um, I also, my email address is, is up here on the screen, so if you, if you have any questions um, specific and you'd like to email them to me, I'm happy to answer, answer emails. And then we also have our website, riverlifepgh.org, if you want to revisit any of the information that I presented here today. Thanks, Nina. Um, I haven't seen any questions come through, um, but I have a bit of a discussion point slash question um, to sort of, sort of uh, the, uh, four of the seven workshops that you facilitated, I was a, a fortunate to attend. And um, they were very different. And some of them, like for instance, in the city of Chester, there was just a small little section that was owned by the, two property owners where we were dealing with mm -hmm. one project. And then we were in Morgantown, and there was all sorts of excitement. We have uh, a trail going through through Morgantown. We have a developed riverfront for recreation. And so there was all sorts of excitement, and there was all different projects that were uh, discussed. And um, I remember speaking with you after our meeting in Morgantown about how we needed to have a keeper of the dream and those sorts of things. Um, what... Um, if you were to imagine getting an entity like River Life started in Morgantown, where where would you start? With the city or? Um... Yeah, well, just from our experience um, in Pittsburgh, River Life was first formed as a task force out of the mayor's office, and it was out, out of the mayor's office, and then included a number of incredible uh, community advocates who also were um, owners of of major corporations in the city who helped fund the initiative, but also were, what you just said, the keepers of the dream in addition to River Life. Um, I think, um, you know, the city has the capacity and the ability to say, okay, we're going to focus on this, we're going to make it a priority, and then be able to um, find who can help fund it, who can help implement it. Um, and so I think from our experience, that's, that's how it happened. And I think in more in town, since that, that was a specific example, I would recommend that as a as moving forward, like maybe it's the planning department um, or the mayor's office, you know, appoint someone who then can oversee the implementation of a, of a master plan. Um, and as Anna mentioned, you know, each of the communities that we worked with were very different. And we knew then, we knew that there had been work already been, um, there had work already been done in many of these communities. Um, and we were coming in just as a uh, organization that had been through a lot of it before but wanted to be there to offer our assistance in any way that we could, so whether that was funding questions um, that my colleague Jay, that's his expertise, or if it's more planning and design, which is my expertise, um, we were able to kind of work through some of the issues depending on what the priorities were, or what the next steps were, or even what the roadblocks were that we identified through the, through the, word, um, the word brainstorming. Um, and I think it was exciting for me to personally just to see the just breadth of project types and, and, and um, community organizations that already exist um, that are there to help make this, help make um, riverfront development everywhere possible. Um, but I think in, in Morgantown, it was, that was a unique scenario where there were so many different projects that were going on. Our recommendation is to, um, you know, put together a master plan at a, at a river scale. Um, at a citywide scale to focus everyone's attention and get everybody to the same page on a on a big vision so that you don't have kayak launches at every single development. You know, you figure out where the best kayak launch could be or where the best focused commercial development should be. Um, and in that way, you get the coalition building and buy-in 
earlier on in the in the in the process, and I think that's where you know the responsibility of a city government uh, comes into play and where they're most effective. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And so, would you see the master plan being created before the organization to carry it out, or would the organization be formed or take on the project? And I think the organization yeah. could take it on. You know, I think the city government could say, we want to make this a priority. They create a somebody either in the planning department or or create a new position or a new department um, or a new organization or a task force. Um, and then River Life spun off as a nonprofit because um, there was the need to oversee the implementation of lots of construction projects and the planning and the vision. And so then it became its own, own right. nonprofit. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. That makes sense. Okay, do we have any other questions? Anyone? Okay, thank you, Nina, and thanks everyone You're for welcome. joining us. Well, it looks like we did have a question come through. Um, oh, great. It says, have you successfully dealt with conflicts between recreational and commercial marine port uses? Um, and port. So. Um, in Pittsburgh, there's definitely a separation of the two, and I think that's been a big part of our vision plan was identifying where best different activities would occur, and so that you wouldn't have that overlap. But if it's in a smaller area and you and there's obviously the need for both, I think um, the best way to go about that is getting if it if it hasn't already happened, getting everybody to the table to discuss, you know, either if it's like a time timing of use throughout the year um, or even down to the week. Um, um, but you being that facilitator to ensure that everybody is talking to each other and that it's not just, you know, because uh, often, you know, you're getting everybody to, to communicate with one another um, and come to a, you know, it's a, it's a negotiation strategy. So it's a lot about <laughs> negotiating different desires and, and, and coming to a compromise that benefits everybody. Um, but if you have if you have an organization that can act as that mediator, then then you can come to a common vision of, of what um, what to do mo moving forward. Right. Okay. That answer. That makes sense. That's a really tricky one. <laughs> it is very. Um, it is tricky, and it, it has a lot to yeah. do with the individual nature of, of people, and then also the properties that you have. Um, but I think the key is is just. Um, this is where you know government. This is their role as as, as uh, you know playing playing the mediator and, and helping facilitate these conversations. Or if it's a nonprofit that can help facilitate these conversations, um, you know, getting all the expectations out there and then and then navigating how you can make it happen. Right. And well, these riverfronts are. I mean, they were developed for industry. So I mean, right. the yep. trend uh, that you're trying to create is sort of going from industrial to more community space. So it's like yep. how you sort of mediating that along the way. Yeah. Uh, and I and so. I think there you have to have in this region, I think there's still so much use of the riverfront for industrial purposes that there has to be a middle ground between the two. It's not just going to be pure riverfront trail and no industry because you still have the barges going up and down the river and there are various uh, rules and regulations related to how you can develop the edges. Um, but you know actually in, in Boston there's there's good precedent for the, the harbor in Boston um, to making sure and ensuring that there's still the industrial waterfront use along with the recreational use. And um, uh, Boston's done a good job. The Boston Harbor Association has done a good job of uh, mediating those differences and making sure that there's a balance between the two. OK. Great. All right, any other questions? I don't see any others coming through. This window is very small, though. Um, OK, well, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, Nina. And uh, like You're I said, welcome. this is recorded, so we'll be sharing this on our website very soon. And um, yep. And, uh, well, thank you, everybody, for being here. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.